Good evening. We are Coping Life Talk, and we are live uh, for 107th time. We started two years ago, and uh, Kenji Sheehan and Scott Kiddle are our regular podcast co-hosts. Today we um, host James Daly, and the topic is very important and very, very uh, interesting because you will share with us not only about minority representation in um, classical music, but also what does it mean to be a young entrepreneur? So James, please introduce yourself. Well, that was a pretty good introduction. Um, my name is James Daly. I am a classical pianist, composer, and educator. I own San Ramon Academy of Music, as well as teach piano um, for the company. And I also run the brand Powerful Piano as well, which is uh, for giving access to music and classical music learning materials to students everywhere. Wonderful. So uh, let's begin talking about this uh, absolutely uh, important topic, especially now with all this racial um, revolts that we had and the, all the uh, events that happened in the last years. Uh, and some of them especially became hot during COVID. And here we are talking about classical music that's supposed to be so calm and so relaxing. And so I want to, first of all, say that when people don't know um, why this topic is so important, uh, first of all, because classical music history is not taught at schools. And we probably think that um, what, what I probably uh, think people will recall is a black violin group, which I love. Mm -hmm. It's just an amazing uh, quartet of uh, very talented musicians. And, but it's a different genre, uh, though they play lots of classical pieces. And I know that Scott and I, we went to see the concert and we enjoyed it very much. And so um, I went into history and I realized that there were names back even in 18th century, like Joseph Ballon, a Chevalier de Saint George, and interestingly enough, that he was creating during the time of Mozart and he was dubbed as Black Mozart. So James, Please, uh, talk talk a little, um, if you planned to talk a little about history. I think it's fascinating. I, th I think that's a really, um, one, congrats for knowing about St. George. Not a lot of people know about him. He's such an interesting person, like a true Renaissance man. He's actually famous for mm -hmm. not only being an amazing composer, but also very skilled uh, fencer and duelist, yeah. which is kind of interesting. I love that uh, duality of athletic and... Uh, I guess, intellectual prowess. Um, classical music history is an interesting thing because, I mean, you can't, t you can't take it away from its past, right? And, you know, the history of classical music, I mean, if you start, let's say, with late Renaissance, early Baroque music, you know, that's like 1500. So at that time, the standards of representation, I mean, were, were very, very different. Um, it's hard to separate things from its past. I think a good example of that is like Richard Wagner is a Terrible, terrible racist. Um, there's a reason that, you know, Hitler reappropriated his music um, for Nazi Germany. But at the same time, the music is beautiful. It's just um, classical music has never been the most inviting space for minorities, not just because of its history, you know, when um, a lack of representation and racism and slavery were very commonplace, um, but also because of the access to education I think um, I'm very lucky that my mother's a violinist, my grandmother, um, there's actually a picture of her behind me right there playing piano in like the 1940s is a uh, classical pianist. And they were my first teachers. I think that there's plenty of people that I know that would be very interested in classical music if they're a little bit more connected with the history, connected with the music as a whole. I think there's a reason that it stands the test of time. You know, um, if you listen to, I don't know, I mean, pick a piece, you know, like uh, Tchaikovsky's Pathetique Symphony. Um, there's something that crosses all barriers that makes that a beautiful, moving piece of music. If that, uh, if that makes sense. And uh, yes, thank you for uh, telling us a little about I, I see the hand here. Um, am I right? So we, we talk about 
difficulties of uh, minority musicians make their way in classical music because we know jazz and blues and um, uh, r and it's all uh, represented um, I think equally, and minority musicians are awesome and everybody uh, loves them and wants to see their concerts, but why it's so different with classical music? I'd say it's a little bit about the culture of classical music. There's definitely an air of exclusivity to it. I mean, if um, you're familiar with just the, um, the history of competition within classical music, it's very much steeped in pedagogical context of like this person taught it this way so the piece must be interpreted like this I think there's a lot more um, f it's more naturally accepted to have differences in interpretation and a more free style of music such as jazz or blues or the other genres that you mentioned um, and also it's expensive to get good at classical music like cellos cost thousands of dollars mm -hmm. a good violin costs hundreds of dollars a harp costs thousands of dollars so even non-piano like orchestral instruments are extremely expensive and then to pay for the cost of private lessons you know um my mom my mom worked really hard to be able to get me music lessons when i was a kid and you know you don't really think about it then um but you know there's a period a decent sized period where she was a single parent and she'd drive where we lived um she'd drive all the way downtown la drive to pick me up in west la and then drove me to like a music lesson once a week so not only is she paying with a substantial amount of money, it's a substantial amount of time. And I don't think a lot of people are aware of the benefits that music can bring because it's such an us versus them cultural thing. I think that, um, you know, I a lot of my friends when I was growing up didn't really know that I played piano because it was like white people stuff. So I was very like Ooh. adverse to that. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to be made fun of by the people on like the sports teams or the school that I went to and stuff like that. So it was kind of like this thing that I just did. Um, but you know, the, the truth is, I mean, music has given me a career. It's helped me make amazing friends. I mean, classical music paid for my education. I went to UC Berkeley for free because I can play music. Like, and I'm not the best pianist in the department. I wouldn't say I'm the most gifted composer in the department. Um, but just because I have an ability and a want and a desire, it was able to, you know, help fuel and, um, I guess, put my life on a positive path that I think a lot of people um, that I know that I grew up with have not been able to, um, to actualize themselves. And it's not because of lack of talent. It's just because of lack of opportunity. Oh, absolutely. It's not a lack of talent. Go ahead, Candy. Candy, we need to unmute you. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. I, I, I try to block out all the other sound from my noisy household. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I, I was just thinking about, uh, you know, how you came to have this love of classical music. What drove you this direction? Because it kind of sounds like you started this at a rather young age. How did you know? And you, you tell me you're not gifted, but I know that you must be very gifted in order to do this. So that's that I really do believe, but what led you down the classical uh, pathway? That's a great question. Um, it was very circuitous. <laughs> so it wasn't like a straight uh, shot. I started taking piano lessons when I was like three, I think, um, from my grandmother and my mother. Um, and then I moved into formal lessons when I was like six. And then it was, I mean, I had an amazing first teacher. I always had, um, like attention issues. So it was always hard for me to sit still for long periods of time. So that man was a saint <laughs> for sitting with me. Um, but, you know, he taught um, in a very, I wouldn't say, um, just kind of like an old school style. He's a very sweet man. So it wasn't old school in the sense of like he would hit my hands or anything like that, uh, which a lot of like very old school piano teachers would do. Um, but, you know, I started with like Bach inventions when I was like six and just, Wow. it didn't connect it was fun because it was like a little finger puzzle and I was like oh this is cool I can do this thing and my mom likes it and my grandma likes it so I like making them happy so I'm gonna do that um, but I just didn't have a deep connection to it it was very superficial um, so I actually stopped taking piano lessons when I was like 13 um, and I taught myself a few other instruments so I got into playing bass I got into playing guitar and um, growing up in L.A. and just being in a large 
a large school environment. You know, my like my high school had like a incoming freshman class of like a thousand kids. And I think every year the graduating class was like about 200. So it's like a 20% graduation rate. Wow. Um, and just, I, I just needed an outlet. And I actually really got into playing like punk and metal and um, like aggressive genres of music. And it's interesting because the, um, the community was so welcoming. And I felt like when I was a kid, when I did a competition or even a recital, like I was the only person that looked like me. My mom was the only person that looked like her at those things. Um, and it just didn't feel, I didn't like feel welcome in classical music, despite having a history of classical musicians in my family. Um, and the, you know, more aggressive music community was so welcoming because there was people of all genders, all orientations, just a very diverse mix of people. Um, and I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of a long story. I'll try and I'll try and nip it as best as I can. But um, I wound up taking a class at a community college for um, just general music theory because I wanted to write better songs for my band at the time that I was in. And um, the teacher that I had, uh, Professor Dutton, amazing man, he, um, I don't know, he just really inspired me to reevaluate my relationship with music. I'd always continued playing piano, but not seriously. Um, and I realized in his class, I was like, wow, I really want to compose. Like, I want to write music outside of this. I feel like I have so much more to say. And I think because I was a little bit older, it was easier for me to want to write more complex or just um, orchestrated music to express my feelings. Um, like most composers, when I express those feelings. Um, <laughs> And it kind of just put me on a path. And it was very interesting because I had almost forgotten how to read music, essentially. So I had to like mm -hmm. teach myself at 18, almost 19, how to read music over the course of two years of community college. And I kind of faked my way through all of my auditions. Like I pre-recorded everything because I was always good at memorization. So I memorized pieces. Um, but yeah, it was a very interesting route. And I think because I was so behind a lot of my classmates, because I got, I got into Berkeley because I got pretty good grades in my community college. Um, it just forced me to really immerse myself in classical music, in the history, in my practice. Like when I was in college, I practiced like eight hours a day for fear of like not <laughs> matching up to the peers around me that were amazing, you know? So I think that um, that really drove me in an almost unsustainable <laughs> fashion, but that just immersed me in classical music and studying composition, studying orchestration. I got to learn uh, musicology under the great Richard Tereskin at UC Berkeley. He's like a mm -hmm. famous musicologist and really learning the history and the cultural context. Like when I'm learning about, you know, German composers and I'm learning the relationship that they had in their music to like the writings of Kant and Schopenhauer. And it just mm -hmm. gives it such deeper meaning, you know? So when I'm listening to a Beethoven symphony, I'm like, whoa, is this the will that he was talking about right here? This is amazing. Um, so yeah, I know that's kind of a, a roundabout answer, but I think that delayed path really gave me deep connection to classical music that I try and give to my students now. James, I was uh, amused your, your statement about taking a music theory class in community college so that you could write better was that contemporaneous with your your punk era? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, I was playing. That's, that's <laughs> interesting because how much theory is in a punk song, right? <laughs> no, basically none. And that's what I felt. I was like, you know, I want to have. Chords. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I want more creative ideas. I want to be able to bring more to the table. And I was like, well, maybe if I took just like a basic music theory class, I'd have some good ideas at the end of the course. You know, so how, yeah. how did music theory uh, open up your that creative palette for you at that time? Oh, man, music theory is my best friend. <laughs> oh, no. um, and it's so interesting because it used to be like my week sight reading, for instance, used to be like my weakest trait. Like I said, I had to relearn how to read music. And I um, there's times in college when, uh, you know, you're like in lecture for theory class and someone would say, oh, can someone sight read this? Oh, James, you're a pianist. I'm like, oh, I'm not feeling too good today. Or I forgot my glasses. Like, I don't wear glasses. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I do all these things to avoid playing. Uh, 
But music theory gave, it's almost like an artist discovering color theory. Like I have a few friends that went to art school and they would complain. They're like, I have to do this giant pad of like, it's like a 20 by 20 thing of going from white all the way to black with like color squares, for instance. And it has to be like perfect gradient the entire way through. Um, And same thing for like making a color wheel and stuff like that. So music theory just give, gave context and definition to specific, um, I guess, idioms within genre or just idiom for emotional response. And it's interesting because there's history of that, like all the way, um, like, oh, I'm forgetting the famous French philosopher. He's a, I think, therefore I am. Um, but he Descartes. has- there Descartes. We go. Descartes. Yeah. I, I was like, I know, I know this. Um, but he <laughs> has like a um, mediations on music where he's talking about the effects of certain intervals on the body. So like, for instance, he's talking about a minor second, which is a half step, very close. Right. And he's saying it represents sadness. Um, so it's really interesting that even, you know, before codified music theory, there was a direct causal relationship between emotional response and musical technique. So music theory really gave me the ability to say the things that I want within music and not, and not only that, to be able to play, um, whatever I want. So now when I look at music, I tell my students this all the time, you know, you read music like you would build a house, not like how you would actually read a book. So you need to see the context and the structure of the piece as a whole. And then you kind of put it together, right? You wouldn't build a house like with a wall and then a door and then insulation and then a window and then caulking and ceiling and then have three empty walls, right? So music theory just gives greater context and understanding to music as a whole and just your processing ability as a musician is exponentially heightened. It's like, it's almost like you have x-ray glasses. Like I can look at, like I just learned a Chopin etude um, over a few weeks because I was like, oh, this is the technical pattern that he's asking me to do on the piano. These are the harmonic concepts in here. And these are like the fingering relationships to those. And then it was pretty easy. Something that would have taken me like, you know, six months in college, 10 years ago would have, it's like, you know, four weeks, three weeks now. It's pretty cool. I, I can't help but think that if you if you know theory, it's like seeing um, it's like seeing the music in color as opposed to black and white. Oh, 100 percent. And it's um, especially with good oral training. So being able to hear mm-hmm. music, yeah. it's um, I don't know. I feel like it's just how an artist would look at a painting or, you know, like how an ex like professional athlete would watch someone playing their sport. You know, it's just like this deeper understanding. So when I'm hearing music, I'm like, oh, my gosh, there's a Phrygian cadence right there. I can't believe he resolved yep. to the six like that. <laughs> or, oh, my gosh, this melody, like that minor six at the top is so reminiscent of, you know, X, Y or Z. Um, and it just it, yeah, it's like a much deeper relationship to sound, I think, in general. Yeah. I imagine you you begin to uh, you begin to be able to transcribe a lot more accurately recognize uh, harmonic progressions because you just you just hear the, the how that harmony develops right. They actually those are part of your tests in in your oh, as yeah. an undergrad in music school. So they'll play like a four part Bach chorale and then you have to transcribe all four parts or something oh, like yes. that, or they'll play a progression. And to be honest, those are always the hardest classes for me, musicianship because the ear takes so long to develop. And because I hadn't developed it like that, I was really behind. So I spent a lot of time listening to progressions over and over or like melodic concept over and over. And I remember going to office hours with one of my professors and he's like, you know, the good news is you're getting better. And you're going to be awesome at this one day. He's like, the bad news is probably not in enough time to get the grade you want in my class. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> like, oh, so hot. So, but it was so true. It was so true because now those things are like my greatest skills. And it's just a progression of work, you know, more so than um, a, a natural talent or something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and you brought up quite a few very very serious, um, I would say, obstacles that could stand on the way of minority children to uh, to first of all find interest in classical music because if they are not in the family like yours where your mom played violin, that probably will be so foreign for many children. Another um, is economic part of that, right? So you mentioned the cost of instruments, uh, also driving a child to school uh, and also commitment on the parents' side uh, to put their time into that. Um, and also, I think even in your case, like when you said you wanted to please your mom and grandma, at the same time, you did not develop that passion right away. And it happened late in college. So uh, you see how many obstacles could be on the um, on the side of even a very talented child, right? But again, coming back since our topic today is minority representation in classical music. So um, when you started developing, because I, I could see your eyes just lit up when you started talking about the moment when um, you, how you started understanding music and theory and history, and uh, it just drives you now. And then you became an entrepreneur, and we will talk uh, later about how um, how you became a Zen a Generation Z entrepreneur, and also we will be talking about how to actualize yourself, which is all a part of you. Uh, but also, uh, could we uh, spend a little? time on who is your most favorite uh, black composer for example or minority composer since you write music Ooh, <laughs> that's a tough one that's a tough one and um, it just uh, doesn't have to be the most uh favorite but some someone who motivated you you know my greatest motivator was the pianist uh andre watts because um you know he's a famous black pianist and um I remember there's an episode of Mr. Rogers uh, where Mr. Rogers brings him out and then he plays a song for him and he talks about playing music and he played, and this is a song my grandmother plays and I learned as well, I still play. Um, and it's so cool, I was able to teach it to one of my students recently, the uh, Chopin Revolutionary Etude. And mm -hmm. I just remember, I don't know, this is why representation is so important, you know, because I wasn't watching the episode live. I think it was like a replay or something or my mom was showing me. Maybe it was on like a VHS. I don't even really remember the circumstances that much. Um, but like my mom showed me and it was very much like, a, oh, wow, this person looks like me. Oh, wow. They're doing something that I didn't even think you could do at a piano because um, revolutionary <laughs> too is a very like technical left hand wow. uh, piano study. Um, and it's just fast and furious and like emotional and intense. And, you know, the um, I mean, it's called revolutionary because it's about the um, or at least people's think Chopin didn't actually say one thing or another. He didn't even give it that title, but um, the uh, relationship between Poland and like invading uh, Russian, there's like a long history between Poland and Russia and like war between the two countries. Um, and that just everything, I don't know, it all kind of made sense where I was like, wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. And it's really interesting because there's so many, like we talked about those obstacles. And I think, more so the cultural obstacles that kind of pushed me away from classical music that like made what would have been a really seminal moment not as important at one point in my life and now upon like later reflection i could think wow that was that's one of my first memories that's amazing but even that wasn't enough to really get me to stick with classical music through like my teenage years um, my early teenage years yeah and I think it's it's very important to have a musician or several musicians who uh, kind of motivate you even more than others and follow. Um, so th that's uh, thank you for that. But uh, if we are ready, any questions at this point? Go ahead. One thing that just shocked me, and I'm a retired school teacher, when you said that in LA there were 20% graduation rate, I just didn't even know that could be a thing. And, and it made me think, that you were even more special because coming out of that, when it would have been so easy for you to fail or drop out, you must have had some strong motivators. I, I'm guessing it was your grandmother maybe and your mom. I, I don't know, but I just think that that makes you more special to me. And I just think that makes your story more remarkable just based on, you know, the background where you came from. Oh, well, well, thank you. I actually, um, I didn't graduate high school. I actually left high school halfway through my junior year. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I had an amazing guidance counselor, Miss uh, Miss Trano. She was super cool because I was, I just didn't. I was so disillusioned with high school and just the environment, and I just kind of felt like I was being babysat. I wasn't being challenged. We didn't have a music program. Like I didn't even know you could study music until I went to community college and was like, oh my gosh, I have music classes. That's crazy. Oh wow. Um, which is, I don't. The cognitive distance there is kind of interesting because like my grandmother is an accomplished classical pianist and is a music educator. But like where I was, it was just such a strange, strange, right. you know, thing. Um, but yeah, I think my biggest, hmm, my best and worst trait is that I really have to learn things for myself. I've just huh. kind of yeah. always been that kind of person. And I thought, I was like, school is not challenging me. I don't like being here. I don't feel like this is beneficial for me. At the mm -hmm. time I had a job, so I was like, you know what? Right. I'm just gonna work, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna play music with my band because that's what matters to me. Mm -hmm. And I don't really see, I couldn't see a direct correlation between like education and a better future for myself. Mm -hmm. It was just more like education is this thing off to the side that I have to do. Mm -hmm. um, but my mom, to her credit, she made it like actually a, a point, we're super close now, um, but at the time it was, we had a pretty contentious relationship when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, and she actually kicked me out when I was like, right before I turned 17. So I was like, right. on my own, yeah. I found a roommate on Craigslist. I actually lied about my age. I told him I was 18, oh, no. I was not at the time. Yeah. Um, and I just learned, wow, like after a little bit, I was like, wow, living check to check kind of sucks. This is really hard. Like, I don't like, <laughs> doing yeah. all of my produce shopping at the 99 cent store. Right. <laughs> you know, most people don't even know they have produce. They do. It's not great. Yeah. But they do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think uh, Miss Trina, you know, she told me what before I dropped out, she's like, look, take this test. It's a proficiency exam. Enroll for one class in this community college. I think you're going to like it a little bit more. Like, she's mm -hmm. like you're smart. You shouldn't shouldn't just stop learning. And I was right. like, yeah, but I'm not really learning anything here. That's why I want to leave. And she's like, okay, so just take a class, see how it goes. So um, <laughs> I took a business economics class, like business econ one. And the format of the class fascinated me because it was, I think it was like two tests, three tests on a paper. I was like, wait, there's no babysitting. You don't care if I show up or if I don't. I'm just mm -hmm. graded based on merit. And for a very independent person, that was perfect for me. You know, mm -hmm. I hated the constant check-ins and packets and group projects Why? and all like the nonsense that I felt like high school was kind of imposing mm -hmm. upon me. And then the content of the class, you know, really basic things, learning about, you know, our curves, like how supply and demand affects like product price and stuff like that. But it was, it was really fascinating. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. So I took that one class and then the summer I looked at the course catalog and I was like, you know what, maybe I'll take another. And I was like, oh, wow, they have music classes. That's awesome. I'll take a music class. Perfect. And then, yeah, and then it was kind of from after that one class, I enrolled in like 20 units in the fall. Wow. <laughs> and then I worked, it was, just, it was kind of hard. I worked full time and I went to school full time. So I'd work, mm -hmm. like I'd have to be there at like a little bit after seven in the morning. I'd finish at three. I'd do classes like 3.30 to 10. And then I'd come home wow. and then I'd practice and do homework. And then I'd wake up a few hours after falling asleep and then do it all over, do it all over again. Yeah. yeah. That was two years, two years. Wow. Yeah. Did you, did you must've gotten a GED though, or did you have to have a diploma of some kind to get into college community? College? Um, no, cause you can take classes, but I took the proficiency okay. exam. So it's called the, oh, I see. The that, that would be the equivalent. Yeah. 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 So Got it. that's yeah. what my, um, and maybe you did, I don't know. My guidance counselor, she's very perceptive and yes. she was like, I will sign you up for dual enrollment. You can take this class with me. Yes. Community college. She's like, just take this test. She's like, sure. you can literally pass it without studying. Just show up and take yeah. the test. And right. that's exactly what I did. Perfect. Uh, yeah. But it worked out. It worked out. So I got the uh, the chess beat. I actually still have it framed next to my Berkeley. Very school. good. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> you know, I wonder too, we're talking about minority students, but I, I'm worried that we may do this to many students, regardless of race. And I, they just zone out. And, you know, as a, an educator, that is just heartbreaking to me. And so I'm glad you found your way and I would wish that for every child. But yeah, just, you know, I told my grandson one, 
once. You know, we're not trying to bore you to death. It's kind of a byproduct sometimes, and I hate it. But, you know, I wonder, do you, did you feel like, were you in a school where you felt uh, minorities were not respected or encouraged as much? Or would you say it was pretty much that way for all of us? What do uh, you think about that? You know, well, my school was actually predominantly like minority based. So I think like okay. um, eight, at least 80 percent of the student body was like either black or Hispanic, the majority mm -hmm. of them being black. Um, mm -hmm. And at the time, it's actually a much nicer school now. But at the time, like yeah. they would get kids from like neighboring places from like different inner cities to that one specific mm -hmm. school, which I think is what contributed to the graduation rate being um, what it was. And I, I just think it's, you know, I have friends that teach in a classroom um, still currently and, um, you know, um, the utmost respect to you for doing it um, yourself <laughs> is because it's hard. My first job out of college, I worked as a music director for a K through eight school. And it's so hard because learning, you need a one on one approach and school is in direct opposition to that because you have sure. 15, 20, 30 kids in a class right. at a time. Um, and that's why some kids fall by the wayside and it's. It's right. very difficult because you can't teach a lesson plan 30 different ways at the same time. Right. You know? Sure. So yeah. You have to pick the method that kind of applies to the vast majority of them. But there's, right. of course, naturally going to be some people that uh, fall off along the way. And I think for me, having time, individual one on one time with educators is really what helped my life path, you know, from okay. from high school to community college. Um, so I think the um, to your question. I think it really is the same for for everyone. It's more like less about race and just more about your socioeconomic circumstance. It just so happens that mm -hmm. the majority of people within those socioeconomic circumstances yeah. happen to be minority. Um, right. But if you're not, if education isn't something that's promoted within your family, if you don't have resources to, or just, we are such experiential creatures. Like if you see someone that has an education that yeah. is doing well, you're like, oh, of course, I, I should get right. a degree and I should do that. If that's not what you're seeing, then it just doesn't right. seem like a feasible option. Right. You know? And I think um, for me, one one thing uh, that I'm really passionate about with my, um, you know, my brand Powerful Piano is to kind of try and bridge that gap for people to show people like you can look like how I look like I'm covered in tattoos. <laughs> I'm young, I'm fun, <laughs> but I love classical music like you can be a bunch of different things that seem like they're in opposition to each other because I think so often we get stuck in these paradigms of like what you need to be or what right. you are represented as, whether it's by like your gender, your job, your likes, your dislikes, just the groups that you fall into. Mm -hmm. um, like you can be, you know, like I do competitive powerlifting, so I'm like a weightlifter and a classical musician and there doesn't have to be an either or between those things. And I think that's, the one thing that I really try and connect with people with on, on a level, like you can do whatever it is that you want to do. And I think that's that's actually applies to the second part of your um, podcast today when you will be talking about how to actualize yourself. This is important because it, you show how harmonious your development is. It's music, art, uh, it's also economics. And so before we go into this um, topic of becoming a Gen uh, Z entrepreneur, I have a question about your grandma and your mom. Uh, did your grandmother ever tell you a story? How did she? become a musician yes yeah where did and she take classes so she did her undergrad at um lsu in the south in uh, it's the uh, louisiana yes wow and then she she has a master's in piano performance from dillard university as well um and wow. she actually met my grandfather who um was also a pianist uh at the university and they were one of, I think it was two or three um, black couples in Dillard University, like period. So they went to college before desegregation was legalized. Wow, that's um, impressive. So there's, and she's older now, so she's like 96. But And it's interesting because a lot of our, um, the other grandkids, they, they don't, I wouldn't say they, 
they don't get along with her as much because she's very direct. She's very harsh. So if she doesn't like something, she'll tell you. And I, I tell them all the time. I'm like, you know, she's not the grandma that bakes cookies, but there's a lot more to get from her than just yeah. that. Um, and it's because of, I think because of her experience, you know, she was put in positions by professors to fail. Like they would give her contemporary music to perform that at the time, Oh, no one's supposed to be able to play this. So she'll fail. And then we won't have to give her a degree. Um, there's, you know, direct instances of things where um, one of her professors like refused to hold who at the time my mom was a child for one of her uh, graduate recitals because they'd never held like a black baby before, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> um, or things like, you know, bricks being thrown through their windows, like crosses being burned on their lawn and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and they actually eventually after graduation, they moved up north to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and that's where my grandmother um became an instructor um, at one of the universities up there. Um, but yeah, those stories are like a, a huge motivator for me now. And I think, you know, when you're a kid, so much just kind of bounces off of you. You're not, you're just there, you know, life is so new that you're not as observant <laughs> of, um, you know, the history before, <laughs> before you. But now, you know, when I talk to her, when I think about those things, it's just, it's a very humbling thing because, yeah. Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, when I was at Berkeley, you know, which is a very progressive university, famous for being progressive uh, culturally and education wise, um, I think there was like three other black people in the music department besides myself, you know, out of like almost 400 kids. So I think that's like less than 1%. Wow. Yeah, wow. you know, so it's, but no one threw like bricks through my window. Everyone was really nice. So it's, I'm very grateful and it would be very disingenuous of me to act as if those two things, those two struggles are even comparable, you know? Yeah. That's fascinating. Thank you for that. Because I think it's very important to, um, for our audience to hear about your roots. And you're right, because if children do not have any example of an adult mom or dad in the family who have education, of course, it's just, you it, it cannot follow anybody who does not do that, especially when it comes to music. So, um, James, uh, how about you share with us now how this idea of becoming an entrepreneur, so you could simply be a performer, a composer, and pursue that route, but instead, uh, and I'm sure that you write and you perform, Tell us about that. But you decided to found your own music academy. Yes, yes. Well, that, um, I mean, it was a, essentially at first out of necessity because it's very hard to get continuous, dependable work as a composer and performer, yeah. in particular for classical music. Um, and what I originally fell into based off of circumstance um, I eventually serendipitously found out was like my passion. I love education almost, if not more than composing or playing. And I think almost now the two go so hand in hand to me that they're like inextric inextricably woven together. So it's very hard to separate myself um, as the educator for me as the performer or me as the composer. Um, and I love, I love teaching because you know, my story is pretty interesting. So I think it's really inspirational for a lot of my students to be like, yeah, dude, like just honestly, if you just believe in yourself, like you don't have to be the best. You don't have to be the most talented. If you're just really willing to work hard, fate and circumstance will put you in the right spot if you walk forward with good intention, you know? Um, and I think that that's really how it worked out for me because I got a job, like I said, um, as a music director at a school um, because I was like, oh, I'll, I'll teach music here. And then I had a great relationship with those kids. It was at this, um, this school in East Oakland off of like International and 15th, which is like a very, it's definitely a really intense area. Like there's open prostitution on the street mm. corners. There's like violence. It's like, it was a really intense environment. But just seeing the impact that music had on those kids was life-changing for me and those kids had a much much more difficult upbringing than I did you know when I explained to people oh I come from a single parent household and yeah it was really hard but you know my mom was college educated she was able to have good job opportunities sometimes she was a consultant so sometimes work would come and work would go and things would be a little bit hard but for the most part it wasn't like how it was for kids at this environment where parents are in and out of jail if not incarcerated for a very long time 
um, or, you know, into prostitution or, you know, being raised by their older siblings or their aunts and their uncles because their parents have been killed or something like that. I had students whose older siblings had been murdered and think like it was, it was an in, in very intense um, environment. Um, but I was so grateful for it because it really, one, made me very grateful for my own experiences um, and also showed me just the power of education and mentorship. But it paid terribly, <laughs> like as I'm sure as you can imagine, most of those jobs do. So I started teaching as an instructor at another, um, at a music academy. So I was just a private piano teacher um, through a private music school. And I did that for quite a few years. And I'm very grateful for that experience because it really helped me develop my curriculum, my, my methods, just the, my resources as an educator and the foundation of my teaching ethos. Um, but I was really frustrated because it was run and just driven in a way that was very profit-based that felt like short-term because I think that if you treat something with love and respect and a genuine good intention, like the money will come, the money will come. You may not have like a higher profit margin now, but you will later because of the lifetime value of a customer, of uh, that student teacher relationship that lasts a long time. Um, and that's really what drove me to make my own company. And it's, it's very interesting because again, another serendipitous thing for me was COVID because um, COVID happened. I had to start teaching online. I had already started transitioning my business I was working like one day at that academy and I was doing uh, my own private studio, but then COVID happened and I realized, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose all my clients. I better figure out how to teach piano online. And then I actually, and I feel very blessed again to be young. So I had so many resources and so many ideas that I felt like I was able to offer a more engaging and connective and immersive product to students as an online teacher. Um, so I left that other school, I started my own thing. And then I just eventually started hiring other teachers to implement my tools and techniques. But I hired them because of the um, educate more so the people that they are, because I knew that would directly reflect on them as an educator. And yeah, the business has been able to grow ever since then. It's been a, it's been a real blessing. I know I keep saying that word a lot, but it's I, I feel very blessed to just kind it's of a good word. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like I've just been walked um, into the path and whether you want to say it's from God or consciousness or spirit or just luck in general, like you can use whatever word you like. You know, I, I, I just can't even imagine how you can do that online, because one of the things that I so worried for teachers through COVID is that teaching online and trying to get your curriculum started is really very frightening. And I wonder, I, I see your picture is frozen, but I hope you're hearing me. How in the world did you develop that and how did that come about? How does that work online if you're teaching someone piano lessons? Yeah, I, I can see that, that James, uh, your picture froze. So we will wait for uh, for James to uh, re-log in or okay. simply wait for the um, connection to get restored. But what I um, found interesting, I visited James um, Daly's company and I, because he's a lead piano um, teacher, so I've read about um, James that his style, teaching style, is different. And then children who usually have problems to relate to the teacher, um, or um, they might be bored, like what you, Candy, were talking about. Um, but a parents write that James find a way to uh, to engage every child in a very unique way. So what he talked previously, remember about that, he, it's, uh, he, he does not think that teaching 30 children according to the same uh, curricular or according to the same method is right. And so that's what I found in um, parents' comments on the website that he definitely tries to find uh, a different way to... Um, to uh, teach every child and so that's why children want to come and they want to uh, to learn and also um what uh, what i found interesting that james um uh, he performed in europe and he performed yes he graduated from university of manchester and also performed classical repertoire across europe 
as both soloist and accompanist. And I think it's a, it's an, it's an accomplishment what he uh, truly talked about today that uh, he was. I hope he will finish today talking about. I hope that he can't, because I want to know just what you were saying, Lydia. I just can't imagine how he did that. I don't want him to tell his secrets because he may have a patent or something. But I just like to know how in the world do you do that? I, I just I have trouble wrapping my head around the fact that you can make each kid feel engaged and feel special. And I just think, wow, how does that work? So, yeah, that, that will, absolutely. Because, you know, my luck with <laughs> teaching teenagers, I just, uh, okay, I just uh, maybe observe. But um, it's interesting because it requires a talent, not only as a performer, in, in this case, uh, since we talked today about musicians, uh, but you as an educator, imagine you taught uh, large groups, right? So you did not teach one on one. I, did you? Did, I got to do lots of small group work. I really did. Ah, so did I thought that was a blessing because making that connection is a very important thing. And it's much more difficult in a big group. That's absolutely true. It's just okay. So, what do you think, Scott? And I will try to see. I will uh, text uh, James. Is he able to reconnect with us or not? I was reminded of um, speaking of of the transition to uh, online classes. Uh, mm -hmm. One of our uh, one of our family members is uh, was a high school teacher, mm -hmm. and had to make that make that transition to Hey James, Hi. good to have you back. Hi. That was a intense technical difficulty there, my. Uh, yeah, no, it's okay. It's okay. We, yeah, <laughs> we just talked, uh, and I think since you're such a modest guy, we talked uh, about your accomplishments uh, when you traveled abroad and you performed in Europe, uh, both as a soloist and a company. So that's I just applaud to you because yeah. there's such a tough audience in Europe. I'm from Europe. <laughs> That's why I'm not a musician because I have a horrible stage fright. And uh, yes, and uh, Kenji, before you logged out, uh, froze. Kenji was talking about um, how tough it is probably to teach online right. during COVID, right? right? And then that was the question I had was without you giving away any secrets, you know, how do you engage a student and make them feel special and really get the work done? I just don't know how that would work. That's because I know so many problem. teachers struggle with that through COVID. It was just, it, it really drove several of them out of the profession. It was really that bad. And so how did you make this work? And how do you make that connection and make them feel special? That's a great question. And it makes sense that you're a teacher that you would ask that. Because um, I get asked questions about this, but that that's the one that I can tell you're, you're in education. I think, um, and I touched on it a little bit earlier, the, um, the fundamental difference between being in a classroom versus one-on-one. -on -one. So piano lessons are all one-on-one. -on -one. And when yeah. you're trying to teach 30 kids in particular on Zoom, so I did a few, um, I, I recently did a commission for the Peck School of Music. I composed for them and I did um, some uh, guest lectures at like local high schools as well as at the university. And I did, I did the first guest lectures online and it was so weird being in that classroom environment again on Zoom because half the kids have their cameras off. You can't tell who's watching, who's listening. Right. So I think that environment, I don't know to answer your question, but okay. as a one-on-one -on -one instructor, I think one, it has to do with you as an instructor. So I know plenty of piano teachers that can't connect in person because they don't make that effort. And I do something with my students um, every, every lesson, and it's funny, all of my students, especially that have had me for a long time, they'll a answer my question before I ask it. Um, but I'm, I'm big on just the, um, the concept of gratitude. And mm -hmm. I don't try and shove that down students' throat. Like, you have to be grateful for things, but just, you know, try and lead by example. And mm -hmm. I always say, tell me something good that happened to you this week. Uh, which is a great question because so often you'll get, oh, nothing good. Oh, is this? And then you can be like, oh, there's always something good. You know, nice. was it, did you have like a really good meal? Did you have some time with your siblings? Did you and mom get to do something together? Did you mm -hmm. accomplish something? Like, did you do well on a test? Did you beat a level in your video? Like anything, yeah. anything, yeah. it's good. So just getting them into that gratitude mindset. And then also it builds rapport. So it's, you know, if it's, 
And some, some people would say, oh, you, you have a 30 minute lesson and you're talking to a student for three to five minutes. That's a large chunk of the lesson time. And I'm like, they practice, or in theory, they should be practicing exponentially more than the time that they right. have with me. So if Absolutely. they feel like a deeper connection with me, if they feel that I care about them and their progress, right. they're gonna be self-motivated. And the best lessons that I ever learned were the ones that I had to implement myself from a teacher because I was so motivated because I was like, I want to make them proud. Like my piano teacher in Berkeley, part of the reason I would literally practice eight hours a day is because Martha was just the sweetest woman and she just wanted the best for me. And I was very insecure about my playing ability because of my reading skill. Um, and just there was amazing pianist in the department and just her nurturing nature and her talking to me before or after a lesson made me be like, I want to make her proud when mm -hmm. I have my next jury recital, you know? Oh, I love and that. I, I just think that's perfect. Let me applaud that. I love that philosophy. <laughs> that is exactly what works. And you know, that, that is, I use much the uh -oh. same. I can't hear you. Oh no. oh no. Is my audio down? And I'm not muted this time. Well, I was, I'm, I'm really pleased about that. I think that's a wonderful way to establish rapport and make your kids care. That's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so it seems like James is having a, a technical issue. Uh -oh. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? I think, uh, I think my audio went away. Let me see. If okay. I can, uh, okay. Maybe but change so, my speaker. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, oh, yeah, so something, okay. something happened with my headphones. So okay, it, <laughs> that's my fine. My laptop died. My headphones aren't working. Oh god. <laughs> okay. I'm oh, so you... sorry, Candy. Can you repeat that one more time? I missed all of that. <laughs> okay. Well, I was just saying I applaud that philosophy because I do think that is exactly what works with children, and it's that is how that that's. I disagree so much with what you said, and I just think that's so wonderful, and so I applauded that because I I, I think yeah. that is so very important. Yeah, if you can make them care, they will just do what they will do amazing things because they know you care, they care. Thank you. Yeah. That's wonderful. wonderful. Uh, thank you, Candy. This is so good to have you connected to teachers. Uh, and both you, um, you and James, and uh, uh, share this enthusiasm to help children. To, to get information, the knowledge that you try to give them. And um, th that's tough. So thank you so much for doing that. Scott had a question. When you had technical difficulty, he was talking about uh, also important thing. Oh, uh, well, actually, actually, I think the question that I'd like to ask is, so um, you have a unique story that is, is very inspiring. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that you not only are looking for, for prospective customers, but, but you have a passion for reaching out to, to children and benefiting the, the community. What kind of outreach things do you do to uh, perhaps get the, the, the good news of, 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 of music education out to folks? I'm so happy you asked that. That's actually why I started the uh, Powerful Piano brand. And that's why I made my company um, and really have been working on expanding it. So I think in the direct sense with San Ramon Academy of Music, I've hired um, teachers all over the country, but teachers that I, I would want to learn from, people that I really respect. And not just because they have an interesting story, which they do. I think any musician, you know, you're drawn to this because of something unique about yourself. And to be good at something, there's always trials and tribulations. So the um, my mom has this saying, everyone carries this invisible yoke. You just can't see what's in it. Mm. But everyone, everyone carries yeah. the yoke. Um, and being able to empathize um, with students and um, is, is so important. So um, having instructors and then just being able to give online lessons so we can have students anywhere be able to connect with a teacher that really cares it's not just the local music teacher because it's five minutes away but it's someone that's extremely passionate extremely motivated and dedicated to this specific style of teaching and that's why i love being the business owner because there's plenty of amazing musicians that i interviewed for the positions but it's very much um a philosophy fit right so i'm like you know 
I think that your teaching philosophy just doesn't fit what I want. And I think you're a great teacher. I, I, it's nothing about you as an educator, but everyone on my staff is very similar to me. So I think that outreach is me at the top, but then I have amazing people underneath me that can kind of spread it to students that I wouldn't teach. And then the, the next thing is I started Powerful Piano because I know, and I kind of touched on it a little bit, the financial cost of private lessons is, is a lot. <laughs> Is a lot, you know. Yeah. I think um, I work really hard to keep the cost of the school's lessons as affordable as possible. But still, some, you know, there's some families, especially now with the way things are with goods and services, you can't pay 200 bucks a month, 300 bucks a month for music lessons, yeah. you know. And it's just it's not feasible when you need to put food on your table. If it's piano lessons or groceries, you you should you should pick the groceries. <laughs> um, yeah. So I started Powerful Piano as a brand. Um, through Instagram and YouTube because those platforms, for all of their drawbacks, I think the best thing is that you can connect with anyone anywhere on their time. Right. So I've put out a lot of educational material on those platforms. I think that there's a lot of disingenuous piano learning platforms and applications and things like that because like with all things, technique is the foundation for your success. So they'll teach right. you how to play a song, but they won't teach you the correct technique or how... You, the the motor pattern that you need to have as close to as possible linear progress at the piano because eventually you're going to hit a point where your technique will have you hit a wall and but previously I would get students from other studios when I was working at a music school and I'd be like I'm so sorry dude but we're basically going to have to spend a year like starting over because yeah. the music you want to play you're just not going to be able to do and we literally have to unlearn this like mm -hmm. neurological pattern that is built into your fingers and it can be done it's just, I'm really sorry. We're going to have to take like four steps back before we can move forward. Um, so that is like a huge component of my YouTube channel. So I do a lot of technique-based things. I have a lot of music theory videos. Um, and I love having that for free. It's just, you can access that at any time. Um, so I have the foundation of what I do for, it's like a 10 lesson boot camp, for instance, on there. So like if you've never played piano, it has the uh, idiosyncrasies of piano technique that you want to be thinking about and striving for. Um, and then also just the rebranding of classical music, because I think to get the word out, you have to get people to see it as something that they are related to in some way. It can't just be this strange esoteric thing where it's like, you know, oh, that's the violin <laughs> music. And I got that so many times. I was showing, I was showing one of my friends Schubert's Unfinished Symphony, which is just, you know, you I mean, it's, it's one of the most beautiful pieces of music and it's this perfect example of like late classical early romantic german style and then i think they were like oh this sounds like remember the titans like the movie soundtrack and i was like no, oh, not, oh, I'm I'm not, not oh my gosh um <laughs> but understanding like the history i think and also having a direct cultural connection to the music would create that delineation of the ear palette, essentially. I don't know how else to put that. Sure. Um, so where you appreciate, you're like, wow, this is moving instead of like, oh, there's some violins playing. Um, so I put some time into the visual rebranding. So I've, uh, as a way to also help supplement the video costs and all the things that I do um, that I have to pay for out of pocket to make that channel work. Uh, I've made some merch. So we have like, Classical composers kind of reimagined as how I look. <laughs> so it's like, you know, uh, we're coming out with a Bach design. Uh, the pre-order's up now, actually, at thepowerfulpiano.com. And he's got, like, you know, full chest tattoos and hand and arm sleeves and, like, face tattoos and stuff. But I think, you know, it's supposed to be, like, cultural juxtaposition. And it looks cool. So if you're into pop art and that sort of thing or, like, a Warhol-type fan, you're just going to enjoy it, you know, irrespective but I, the, the deeper meaning there is that I think if these artists were placed in contemporary times, you probably would see Mozart with face tattoos because, I mean, the way that he lived, he had a, an apartment where he kept his family. And then he also had his Vienna apartment where he did drugs and partied with women and did a lot of like scandalous activity. And no one really, when you think about Mozart, you, you don't think about that, you know, and he no. died and was put in a pauper's grave because he spent all of his money <laughs> um, living. And if that's not like a rock star lifestyle, like I don't, I don't know what it is, you know, but I think it's forming those connections. That's the important thing. And that's why I love social media. 
um, because I can put something on Instagram and someone in like Uzbekistan can see it and connect with it. Someone in inner city Detroit can see it and connect with it. You know, and if they see a little bit of themselves in me, hopefully they'll have that next step pathway of, oh, well, he thinks this is interesting and I do X, Y, or Z, or I look like X, Y, or Z similar to him. Maybe I will too. And then just that little spark of curiosity will hopefully become a long and uh, fruitful relationship with classical music. That's the goal, at least. I have a question. Uh, oh, go go ahead. ahead. No, I'm no, just no. going to say, uh, you, you, you have a, a really distinct advantage being you're, you're young, uh, you're a, a fairly good looking young man, okay. uh, and you're hip. And so you can, you can reach, you can reach uh, a part of the population that I never could as a 65 year old balding white guy, you know, uh, young people can look at you and think, well, he's hip and, and he likes this kind of music um, that it kind of tears down some of the obstacles, some of the walls, I think that we build in our, in our thinking. Right. Yes. Yes. And, you know, I think um, one thing that, um, I wouldn't say, you know, it's kind of hard to figure out how to put this without offending certain people. I think that there's a lot of really good things that have come from, you know, the new age of like woke culture and being aware of different limitations from certain, you know, cultural or like race or sexual orientation, all those things, you know, that there's difficulties, but there's also advantages too. So it's very disingenuous to act as if like, you know, everything in my life is harder because I'm a minor minority. You know, that's just not the case. There is definitely a significant portion of things that I had to deal with growing up that were harder than some people in a different socioeconomic situation or, you know, of a different skin color, something like that. But I think, you know, like the reason I got a full scholarship to Berkeley, you know, I was on my own. So I put my financial earnings on there as part of my scholarship application, you know, and I put that I am black, like they needed X amount of students to fit that, you know, box. And I'm, it, there's, it's there for a reason because I wouldn't have been able to go or afford school without that. So I took full advantage of it. But to act as if like that's something that is a disadvantage, I don't know, it just feels just feels kind of wrong. So to your to your point, I, I definitely see those things that you mentioned as positives, um, which is why I'm really motivated to do this now while I'm still young and yep. uh, not I'm quite yet. <laughs> it's starting, but I got I to gotta get it in before I lose too much. <laughs> it, it, it's a real challenge to stay hip. You know? <laughs> yeah, before before it gets to that point. But so, uh, James, I'm very curious. You performed abroad, and um, and I it's it's interesting because I can't help it to compare uh, minority musicians also in my former country, which is Russia, Soviet Union. And I was so uh, interested when I was in Kansas City, uh, Missouri. We had a Kazakh piano player, classical Kazan, um, piano player, Alim. Based in Bayev. And he recently in 2021, he um, won the first prize in the 20th edition of the Leeds International Piano Competition. So every music, and that was astounding to me because uh, in every country, not only in America, minority musicians have a problem to, to make it to the top. And so my question is, of course, what makes your style as a piano player unique when people say, oh, that's James Daly playing? Well, that's a great question. I love that question. Thank you. And I think it's interesting, too, because within classical music, you know, you have a score and then you have historical interpretation of said score. Yeah. So there's um, and something that I tell my students, you know, I want you to make the music yours. Beethoven is dead. He's not going to come out of the grave and grab your arm and say, that says Forte. How dare you play a piano? Um, so I think I break a lot of rules when I perform and I, I, I love and it. it's not it's not because I'm trying to be like difficult it's just because I feel the music in the way that I feel the music and I think yeah. that um you know there's this interesting perfectionist quality to classical music I think it's the only genre of music where you literally have to be perfect you have to be perfect there is absolutely zero chance for error and especially within the competition setting you know and I have students that do competitions I have a rule where they have to ask me I don't push it on my students and if they not especially not the parents if the student asks me 
and they say that's something they would like to do, I'm like, yes, dude, let's do it. It'll be a great experience for you. But specifically within the competition setting, you have to, you're, I mean, for lack of a better term, you're almost like a robot because you have to follow someone else's specific interpretation or like very specific to the aesthetics of the, of the period. Um, you can't play in the way that most deeply resonates with you. So I think my style of interpretation is very much rooted in understanding of the musical theory of the, of the piece. So because I'm a composer, not to say that I could write the music of Beethoven or Chopin, because I definitely cannot, but I can understand it from a structural level. There's are certain things that I like to do within my interpretations of the piece that wouldn't be commonplace, but I think bring out certain qualities that I find really interesting, you know? And it's almost like, um, it kind of reminds me, when I was, um, I went to the Sistine Chapel, uh, I was really lucky. And then like, you're looking up, there's just so much to take in at once. And I feel like a, a masterpiece, like a true masterpiece, a uh, piece of music is almost like that. There's so much to take in. It's just your job as the per compose, or performer rather, to decide what you want to highlight, what you want to bring the ear of the audience to. And I think um, because I resonate with the music in such a deep way, I try and make zero apologies for the interpretation decisions that I make. And I tell my students to do the same. I'm like, if you can convince me why you think it should sound like that, do it. Just be convincing and have a, have a reason. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. This is a this is a very good answer because especially since you um, talked about how you actualize yourself, and uh, um, I looked at the website and I found out something about you that uh, I think is uh, answering my question because. Um, that's what I think you have this unique approach to music because as you said, you're also, besides that you're a musician, composer, uh, you also weightlifter, but also uh, you like cooking, you like reading and even drawing. And I think, is it why you, you look at music, a kind of a new piece and you just like, you feel it different because of who you are? I think it's very important to develop all facets of your artistry, just as a person. Like you don't have to be a musician, you don't have to be a painter that does exquisite oil painting, but I just think an essential part of the human condition is artistic expression. And I don't think you have to be the best at something to, to partake in it. Um, so I think all those things, like for me, cooking, for instance, is art. It is so much fun. It's like a love language for me. I love cooking for my fiance. Um, and that's like, actually, it was kind of like the crux of our relationship when I first started cooking for her. So for me, food is like a very um, connective thing. And then, you know, there's cultural implications from breaking bread and sharing uh, meals with people and things like that. So, you know, to me, that's art just as much as drawing a picture is. Um, I enjoy nature. My, so from the Bach experience that I had as a kid, I hated playing Bach, right? And my teacher, Martha, she was like, she really wanted me to do, um, I'm forgetting which fugue, but she wanted me to do a fugue to work on some finger independence technique that I was kind of lagging in in college. And I told her, I was like, I just don't like Bach. I just don't like it. And she <laughs> told me, she's like, all right, if you can go into nature, and she's like, I mean, like, really into nature and listen to Bach, and you still don't like it, you don't have to play it. And I was like, okay. Uh, so I, like kind of by happenstance, I went on a trip to Yosemite and then I listened to the um, the Bach, what is it? I think it was the Partitas, um, a bunch of like solo violin pieces. Uh, and I'm just surrounded by nature and these trees. And, and I was like, oh my gosh, Bach is literally the music of heaven. This is kind of crazy. And it made me appreciate the music on such a deeper level, but also made me appreciate nature too. So I love spending time hiking, being in nature. I think all these things are like, a part of the mosaic that makes the human condition the human condition. And I think that a lot of the way that we've structured our society, we've structured our education, is that we get so narrow minded that, you know, it feels like it's better to be in a singular pursuit when I think all of the multitude of pursuits that I have make each one special for me. And I realized in college, like, it's unsustainable to practice piano eight hours a day. It's not, it's not good. It's not a healthy thing to do. Um, and I realized that I don't have to practice as much to be a better musician. So all of those things, I think, 
make me a better musician because my musicianship is my expression of self. So if I have a better and more clearly defined version of self, that helps my playing of Chopin just as much as playing the same measure a million times over. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that's that's an excellent answer and also i think it's a coaching advice since we are coping life talk many musicians sometimes feel stuck just like writers like a writing blog and probably um composers have a writing blog and then musicians who perform uh even even teachers sometimes everything starts looking so dull and no inspiration so what i hear is get out go into nature uh, breathe listen and just grow constantly grow grow and uh, this is a perfect advice and i'm sure that uh, your grandmother and your mother continue being your inspiration please uh, say hello to them and uh, <laughs> our just admiration to them that they raise such a wonderful talented not just son and grandson but also musician composer and also international performer thank you so much for sharing with us today about your academy about your life and also about your teaching style and your performing style congratulations to you uh, you're just a, a unique individual and uh, i will keep you on my list because we want to have you back and to hear again about, um, as a young man, like now you have a fiancé, and maybe we can talk about um, other aspects of the life of a musician and who is a young entrepreneur, Gen, Gen Z, uh, but also a man, a man who actualizes himself in an area that is not popular even among a minority groups because not every minority it's a cultural aspect of that it's like why are you doing that it's like how odd going to blues going to jazz so thank you so much i think it's inspiring thank you candy thank you scott and um uh, we are coping live talk number 107 we will see you next saturday thank you james again thank you guys so much for having me thank, thank you. you god bless thank you god bless